In this episode, I speak with Jess. She shares with me the two very different stories of her two breech presenting babies. Her first breech baby, an unnecessary cesarean, and the second breech baby, birthed free of the medical system. Jess tells the story of how she ended up having two free births after her first unnecessary cesarean, while also speaking to the very beautiful lessons that she learned along the way. Have a listen to Jess's story of birthing her babies in freedom and even wishing her birth processes could have lasted a little longer. Hello, Jess. Thank you so much for coming on to this podcast. I'm so excited to hear your stories. Excuse me. Happy to be here. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Good. I've heard two of your stories, so I'm very excited to hear this third one, um, your breech birth. And <clears throat> oh my goodness, excuse me. Sorry. <clears throat> so <laughs> let's just get right into it and then I'll mute myself so I can finish coughing. But <laughs> where or pardon, what is the lineage and ancestry that you're passing down to your children? I love this question so much. Um, so I am mixed. And so my mother is, her family is from um, Ireland and then Scotland, of course. (laughs) And then um, my father's side is very interesting, um, all over Africa, some some Southeast Asian. um, And yeah, his family you know, came to be enslaved. And so there's, yeah, just a lot of mixture in there. Um, and so, yeah, I love being mixed. Something that I really love about my lineage too, is that, um, my great, great grandmother was a granny midwife in the South. No way. That's so cool. Wow. I just got chills. Wow. That's amazing. How did you find that out? My grandmother um, was, del- you know, delivered by her, like mm-hmm. her, she attended my grandmother's like when she was born. Um, so when my grandmother was born, it was twins. And so it was a twin home birth. And yeah, my, her grandmother, my great, great grandmother was there. Wow. Oh my gosh. That is so cool. Yes. So now that I'm, you know, attending births, whenever it feels aligned and everything, it's just so beautiful to have that Mm. connection that just feels so close, you know, Mm -hmm. as opposed to we all have like, you know, women in our ancestral line that were midwives and attend birth, attended births and all of that. But like, this feels so intimate, so close. Mm -hmm. Um, it, I feel like so honored to be, um, a product, you know, of that wisdom and being able to reclaim that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so nice. Like you said, we have these ancestral lines, but most of us don't know about them. So we kind of, we can tap into that energy, you know, when we're praying about it and asking Mm -hmm. for the guidance of our elders and things like that, but actually having that just what is that one two three generations back that's Mm -hmm. wow that's so incredible to know that you've got such that um you have such a close direct line to this woman and then of course like you said you're doing the work now so it's yeah Mm -hmm. it's even more potent I think that's that's amazing Mm -hmm. wow well thank you so much for sharing that and yeah I love that you've got this whole beautiful mix within you of you know places Scotland and Ireland and Southeast Asia and Africa it's you know it's just a beautiful joining of these cultures that Mm -hmm. and then there's you so yeah it's yeah it's really cool to know that that um you have all of this within you it's it's really cool. (laughs) Yes I'm a product of so much love. Mm -hmm. Yeah yeah and it's like I could talk about this for (laughs) <laughs> yeah, for so long. I always get caught up in this question when I ask people, because the whole, like lineage and ancestry thing can go so deep. Like you said, you okay. had family <clears throat> that was enslaved and went through all of this and, you know, through the whole colonization journey. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also important as well to bring these aspects of our of ourselves up when we're talking about this free birthing in color um, 
on this podcast and sharing these stories and having these women share, because when you get to look back into the line of what they've come from, you know, Mm -hmm. their history of the women, it really does kind of, in my perspective, and I could be wrong, but -hmm. I think it really does like shape who the women are today and where their power has really come from and where they've collected that strength so that they're not necessarily holding on to that trauma of those past woes, but they're turning it into the strength of who they are now and then like I said passing it on to their children so it's something that can be turned beautiful and there can be lots of healing and and reclamation in yes so (laughs) anyways I'll stop because (laughs) I have one more comment that I just like I just it just hit me as you were saying it that it's like this wisdom is so inevitably passed down in every single culture Mm -hmm. it lives inside of us, but it's still, it is still being passed down. Mm -hmm. It's intrinsic, but it's also a learned wisdom from our ancestors that we just all hold. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that just, that just sounded really beautiful to me when I thought about it. So I had to share, but yeah, so this is such a, a beautiful journey to be able to reclaim this and to kind of draw it out of myself to share with others so that they can awaken as well to what they already know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, wow. Beautiful. (laughs) Thank you so much. Um, So moving on so that we can get into your story. I'd love to hear. Um, Where does your motherhood journey begin? Oh, so early. Um, When I was, when I was like 14, I, I just, the mother in me kind of awakened and I started very deeply daydreaming about motherhood. And I was writing poetry about motherhood. I was taking all of like the classes in high school about, you know, child rearing. And I remember sitting in this one class um, for child development where they were like, talking about different options that you'd have at the hospital. Cause you know, that's the only place there is to give birth. Mm-hmm. So they were talking about all the options and the teacher said, Oh, sometimes they'll let you like have a mirror when you're pushing so that you can see your baby come out. And everyone was like, ew. And I was like, oh, yes, <laughs> I was like so excited. I was like, yes, I am choosing whatever hospital has a mirror so I can watch my baby emerge from my yoni. I was just like, so in love with that. And, and so, and it's, it's really funny that my aunt, she had so many home births when I was little and it like, didn't even occur to me that that's like the obvious Mm -hmm. choice because just going to school and learning what the norm is, you're just like, Oh yeah, that's, you know, that's what we do. My aunt has home births, but that's like, I didn't even think it was a bad thing. I just literally didn't think about it, Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm so grateful for the experiences I had with all of that. Um, but yeah, I would like take care of like the fake baby that they'd give us. And I would do it for no reason. I would just ask my teacher if I could take care of the fake robot baby. <laughs> for starters, we should not be doing that. Like we should be just having the maidens take care of real babies with the mothers. Yeah, totally. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, but yeah, I did love that. And I would like hold the fake baby and cry. I'm so imaginative. And that's that's one of the reasons why my births are so amazing Mm because I have a big imagination. Um, but yeah, so I just, I just was loving it. And as I got older and I started doing more research, I found home birth and I was like, well, this is the obvious choice. Um, it made perfect sense to me. And I knew that that's what I would do. I watched like the business of being born documentary and I started looking at like animal births. Mm. Um, And once my husband and I got married, Um, we got pregnant very quickly and, um, I was like, oh yeah, duh, doing a home birth. And I hadn't like researched enough to know what's kind of going on with licensed midwifery. And so I was like, all licensed midwives are angels, you know, like they're Mm -hmm. all perfect. They're Mm -hmm. all these like wise, warm, just want to like hold me and trust me and witness me. And that's just all I wanted. And throughout that pregnancy, I was doing so much research, um, about birth and I did find unassisted birth. 
And it resonated with me so deeply. And I was like, oh yeah, I'll do that with my next birth. But I was so in like people pleasing consciousness that I was like, okay, like I have to prove to everyone that I can give birth with midwives. And I've already hired these midwives. So I need to make them happy, Mm. you know, like keep them on, even though I was hearing all these stories about women dumping their midwives and like loving those stories. But I was like, but not my midwives. Like they were like my only friends (laughs) because I didn't, I also like, wasn't in a place where I was, um, manifesting like community in my life with other women. I was very, um, me and my husband were like, in hibernation and always at home and just together all the time. And so they were the only two women that I like knew in my area that understood anything about birth. And so I, I just did everything to make them happy while still trying to stay in integrity. So I just like said no to all the testing. I didn't do most of the stuff they wanted me to do. I did end up having an ultrasound. Um, and at one. And it was so funny after the ultrasound, they like came to my house and like sat me down and they're like, we have some news. And I was like, Oh, something horrible is going to happen or something horrible is happening. And they were like, your, um, your uterus is, um, septated. And, Mm. and I was like, okay, (laughs) (laughs) so does that mean I can't have a vaginal birth? And they're like, no, you can still have a vaginal birth. And I was like, okay. Then what's They're the like, problem? <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> and they were like, you should get like other doctors, you know, too with us. And I was like, not necessary. We're fine. Mm. Um, so that was, that was a funny experience because um, they really freaked me out. But mm. um, another quick thing um, with them that was interesting as they were, I would always say, I think I'm going to have a breech baby. And they would say, no, you're not. And it was weird. They're like, we don't have to worry about that. I was like, here's the thing. I'm not worried about it. Mm. I'm happy to have a breech baby. I just want to have the conversation about when it happens. Right. It's just pretty sure that that was going to be my reality. Mm. Um, and yeah, so that was, that was really fascinating. Um, And then another thing that kept coming up was them mentioning me being a woman of color and trying to like do it from this um, ally space, you know? So your midwives were both white women then? One of them was um, an indigenous woman. Okay, okay. She was like part part indigenous, Mm. um, mixed. And then yes, the other one was white. And so, but they were just like more than like a woman of color, but being like a black woman. Mm. You know, they were mentioning that a lot and it, it felt really weird. Cause they were like giving me these statistics around what black women experience, like tend to experience in pregnancy and birth and kind of like projecting them onto me mm. um, and like creating some fears for me. Um, and that was, that's still something that I'm sitting with, but it really, it really was so interesting how people who want to be allies, it can, it can, um, it can end up being a microaggression. You know, I mean, there's so many, so many pieces to all of it, you know? Um, but, and I, I've, I've never identified with victimhood, um, when it comes to my, um, my skin color, and my heritage, I've always, um, chosen to not do that. Mm -hmm. But I also, I also know that many of my ancestors were victims Mm -hmm. and it's really interesting when people want to continue to perpetuate that story, because when they perpetuate that story, then it just leads to more victimhood. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's about helping the people that are victims, but not continuing the story on their behalf. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was an interesting experience. Um, but when, when I was finally 37 weeks, um, I, they were palpating my belly and they're like, this baby's feeling breached. And I was like, aha, that's great. (laughs) I was like, that's so funny. I totally knew it. Mm. They were like, okay, you need to go to, you know, a hospital and, or you need to go, you know, get an ultrasound to confirm it. And I was like, I was like, but it's fine. Like if the baby's breech, like who cares if the baby's breech or not, like, let's just do this 
with the assumption that the baby's breached. Cause that's what you're palpating, you know? Mm-hmm. And so they really wanted me to get the ultrasound. So I decided to do that. Um, and the ultrasound tech, she was, you know, going through that process and she was like, yes, your baby's breech. Also your baby's small. And she was kind of flippant about it. And then when we got like more results, um, from it, they were thinking that my baby was like three or four pounds Mm -hmm. and made the assumption that I had potentially an insufficient placenta. Mm. And so that led to my midwives wanting me to go to the hospital and I, that did not feel right. And so I communicated that to them. And then, you know, we had this really long talk where they were like, we're not going to work with you. You know, if you don't go to the hospital Mm. and these women that were my friends, I was just like grabbing at any straw I could to just like avoid going to the hospital, but keeping them as my midwives or having them like find someone else for me, like to show up for me. Um, and they were just completely like, go to the hospital. We're not doing anything else. Right. Um, and, and you that's know, so sad, you know, like you said, your first time mom, you didn't have other community. You were looking mm-hmm. to these women to mm-hmm. support you in this way and, you know, give what you were seeking. And then mm-hmm. one tiny little thing, which probably isn't even true because ultrasounds fuck up all the time and say women are having too big of yeah. two, quote unquote, of babies or too small of babies oh. and like they're just like nope we can't help you it's like that's not that's just not how you do that it's it breaks my heart to hear that yeah. all about numbers and not intuition yeah oh. like not trusting you it's it's crazy and like you knew that you said before, yeah. I feel like I'm gonna have a breech baby, and they just you know mm-hmm. put it off, put it off, and then it's like, oh, but the ultrasound says you're having a breech baby, so there it is. Like, yeah, exactly. Oh, so funny. <laughs> it's, so it's so wild. So yeah, so I I did it like I just and it was so funny. My husband, he was like so so cool with me having an unassisted birth. He's just like, let's just go have an unassisted birth, and I was like, <laughs> I'm not like I just. I mean, it, it helps me like looking back, just understanding like when women are talking about free birth and they're like, I can't do that. I'm like, you're right. If you can't do it, if you don't think you can do it right now, then you're right. Mm-hmm. Cause I had been watching all of these unassisted birth videos. I had been pumping myself up about it. All of the dreams I had had about birth had been unassisted and super casual. And when the time came it was like a clear no. Okay. No, I'm not ready. Like I, my body can do it Mm -hmm. for sure, but it wouldn't be in full integrity for me to up level like this when I'm not ready to do that. Mm. Um, and so I feel like I had to have the experience that I had, not because I meant to suffer, but because it's what I chose. Mm -hmm. And so I've made so much peace with it. And I actually enjoy this story now because for me, it's a really powerful um, lesson on, you know, we birth how we live Mm. and also that, um, yeah, just manifesting your own reality. It's just so real. I kept saying, oh, I'll have an unassisted birth with my second baby. And that's what I ended up doing, (laughs) even though like, I really should have just done it myself, you know, the (laughs) first time, but, um, yeah. So we went to the hospital and I had had like this vision of having a C-section the night before. And I was just crying and scared. Was your husband with you at this time? Or were you just by yourself with the medical midwives? Oh, he was with me. Okay. Yeah. He was with me the whole time, which was really good. Whenever I was like, when I talked to them and I was trying and he kept saying like, well, let's just go home. And I was like, shh. Okay. okay. Embarrass me. You know? like, he's like, let's just do it. Um, but yeah, that was, he's, he's so good with birth. Um, but yeah, so I went to the hospital and I was just kind of like put on a fake smile, pretended like everything was okay because I didn't want to inconvenience the midwives or make them feel uncomfortable with my my birth. <laughs> um, and I just kept thinking like, we're just going for information. And of course, you know, once I finally got the ultrasound, we had waited for like 
two or three hours to get an appointment with a doctor. And he was like, yeah, you have an insufficient supplanta, placenta, Mm -hmm. and you have low amniotic fluid and your baby is really small and you have a septated uterus and he's breached. So we, you know, suggest a C-section. And I was like, I just looked at him and I was like, is there no other way? Like there's nothing else that can be done. And the doctor's like, no, this is the only option. Mm. And, you know, I, I don't know if there was like a lot happening actively against me in the system as a woman of color, but I, I do know that in that moment, I felt like I needed to comply in order to keep myself and my babies safe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, cause you know, it's so I knew that women could be declared, you know, crazy, Yeah. you know, unfit and they can't make their own decisions. So we're going to override whatever she says. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're going to evaluate her and take away her baby once the baby's born. So it's really interesting, just the subtlety in that that it's just, even though I, I was, you know, raised mostly around white people. I mean, I grew up with my, 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 um, black family, um, very close to me, but once we moved out of that, uh, like out of where they were, like we moved from Florida to Arizona, um, I was around mostly white people. And it's really interesting that that's still this, um, subconscious Mm -hmm. Mm decision-making that I had where I was like, okay, I was like, you know, calculating things in my brain. I was like, okay, in this situation, I have to say yes to the C-section in order to fully protect myself and my baby. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, everything happened right away. They shaved me. They, some of the women there were, or the nurses there were really kind. Some of them didn't talk to me didn't want to talk to me. Some of them were really impressed with me, even though I was that I wanted a home birth, but you know, Mm -hmm. it was just, it was really such an interesting experience. And I had the C-section. Um, they took their time with my baby, which was so hard. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was screaming for him. And I had just the most wonderful meeting with him and he nursed actually really well Mm. after the fact. And I did like one thing about being in the hospital and that was the catheter because I had been getting up to pee for months and I finally got to just let it all out, drink as much water as I wanted without, you know, doing my little, when am I going to have to go to the potty calculation? Yeah. <laughs> and so that was like the one thing, but everything else was not, not a, I, I wouldn't say it was like a horrible, horrible, horrible experience, but I learned so much from it. There were so many lessons and it was so easy to say right after I left, like, well, I'm never doing that again. Mm-hmm. And I'm obviously going to try for a free birth next time. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's like, it's just so, and how much did your baby weigh? Oh, thank yeah. you so much for asking that because that's the most important. Yeah. It's almost six pounds. Oh gosh. Well, at 37 weeks, that's very reasonable for a baby size, you know? Totally. So like he was perfect. He Mm -hmm. helped right when he was born. There was nothing wrong with him. Mm -hmm. He was better health than I was. (laughs) (laughs) They kept saying that. And I was like, I know, Mm, of course he is. Um, Something quick to note too, is they did say like one of the nurses showed me my placenta and she's like, look how small it is. And I was like, weird. Mm. So that's like the one, um, I, w- I want to share a little bit about my placenta in every story. Cause it's been, I've had mm. such an interesting journey with my placenta, Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, it, me and my son had a lot of healing to do after that. I mean, he was one of those babies that wanted to nurse all the time, mm. just all the time nursing to the point that he would just be throwing up Oh gosh, yeah, so much. And he was just, we were, that was just his healing. I think, mm. 
um, just really wanting that closeness and that bond to make up for the lack of, um, you know, the lack of physiological connection that should have happened. Mm. Um, and so that was, it was a really, you know, long first year, but I, I felt really so much hope for my upcoming, the next births that I would have. Mm. Um, we got pregnant two years later. Um, and I was living with, um, my mom at the time. And so she was like, really like, you need to find a midwife. You need to find a midwife, you know, like just look for someone. And so I was like, fine, I'll have some interviews. And when I had those interviews, I was very unimpressed. Um, (laughs) it was just so disturbing. Like Mm. this one midwife was like, you're so high risk. I would never, ever work with a woman like you. Oh my God. Yeah. It was so weird. And she's the one that had attended my aunt's births. So like, it was such a weird experience. And then she's like, oh, but you know, I can refer you to this OBGYN. That's just like a midwife. And then mm. she's like, he's great. And I was like, ah. Ew, no, thank you. <laughs> oh, what are you doing? Like, I just was so like, it was one of those moments where I'm like, finally, like waking up, you know, mm. like actually having the experience of asking midwives the real questions. Cause last time I was be my midwife. I don't have any questions. You're perfect. Mm -hmm. so finally asking them and just being like oh wow like I'm not I'm not doing that um and at one point that that same midwife she said oh well if you refuse transfer um whatever midwife is attending you will have to call the police or not not the police gosh sorry (laughs) wrong wrong thing call the ambulance and leave okay And it was just so like, yeah, she was like being completely honest with me about like, you know, their regulations and licensure and stuff. And it was deeply disturbing Mm -hmm. um, that, oh, you know, any licensed midwife that won't do fetal monitoring and checking, you know, checking you internally, your dilation, and they're just irresponsible and don't work with any midwives like that, but you shouldn't be working with any midwives because you're so high risk, blah, 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 blah. Um, it was such a, yeah, so eye opening and beautiful though, for me to have someone be completely honest with me Mm -hmm. (laughs) and, um, show me just the energy Mm -hmm. licensure with midwifery. Um, I found a friend that was, had just gone to school to be a doula. And so I asked her if she'd attend a free birth and she's so lovely, um, and said that she would, I mean, she just, um, she was kind of, you know, hesitant at first too, cause she had been taught, you know, don't attend free births, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and she was kind of asking me like, well, like, what about like, what if you just interview more midwives or, you know, mm-hmm. blah, 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 you know, just asking me about that. And I finally was like, you know, I, I think, um, I think you're, you're feeling scared. Mm-hmm. And so you're, or no, I said something like, like, it sounds like you want me to get a midwife for your comfortability and not for mine. And so she was like, yeah, that's true. (laughs) And so she was able to kind of like work through that. And, um, I'm so grateful. She ended up more officially being like my postpartum doula, but she did still attend my birth just as a friend um, to have that experience. Um, and so that was perfect that I could have someone holding space for me, you know, a woman that I love and trust while still like knowing that she's not going to do any of her hands on doula stuff that I wasn't quite sure about. So it's kind of like a doula attended my birth, but like, she was just kind of hanging out there, (laughs) but she didn't end up helping a lot in the end, which was like amazing. It was so necessary. So like she came with the intention of not being a full on doula, but she did end up doing some stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I had a beautiful pregnancy that was so much fun to like start to kind of let go of the people pleasing. Um, and in that pregnancy, I I lied about having a midwife. I just said like, Oh yeah, I have a midwife. (laughs) I just kept telling people that. And that's just what I needed to do at that time. That's where I was at. And um, so once the birth happened, it was like, 
Oh, it was on my birthday. I, I it was so funny. I kept thinking like, there's like, there's no way she's coming on my birthday. Um, but on like the evening of my birthday around 10 PM, I started, you know, feeling more consistency. I had been having like, you know, prodromal labor stuff, um, before then. And so it was like, okay, this is actually happening. And I just went to the toilet and pooped up a storm and that was wild and fun. <laughs> and then I just went in the closet and, um, just labored by myself on my hands and knees and hugged a pillow. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just, I remember like trying to put on music and I hated the music so much. It's <laughs> really funny to like learn how I labor because that was such a mystery to me before I kept being like, who will I be? Mm, yeah. You know, when I'm in labor, who is laboring Jess? And it was so much fun. Cause yeah, like now I see like women listening to music in labor. I'm like, what are you doing? That's like sensory overload. For <laughs> like Thinking about that, like, Ari, it, it makes me almost feel like claustrophobic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that was so interesting. Um, but yeah, I was, I was just loving it and giving myself motivational speeches and I was very vocal, which was so much fun. Mm-hmm. I love that part of it. Um, I feel like, um, for a lot of women, it's like healing to the throat chakra to be, yes. to fully allow yourself to be in labor because mm-hmm. when you can make those sounds, it's so just like, feels so ancient. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, Oh, I just, mm-hmm. I'm obsessed with birth. If anyone goes yeah. on my Instagram account after this, they'll see that I'm just like, I don't know everything, but I do know that birth is a blast. Yeah. Like it is just the funnest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Mm -hmm. I was just smiling and laughing and it was so intense Mm -hmm. and crazy. Like the sensations and my body is just effortlessly this powerful. Wow. Like, it's just who I am as a woman. Mm -hmm. You have to try to be powerful. Um, yeah. So that, that was amazing. Um, once my, my doula friend came, she turned on the, she turned on the shower for me and she brought like a birth ball that I would, I sat on in the shower mm. and that was really, really helpful. Um, and I was just in the shower singing and yelling and, you know, just having the water run on my back. We have a really big shower. So it was really, um, very spacious. I didn't feel like enclosed. I knew that I wanted to involve water, but, um, I feel once again, claustrophobic by like tubs. Like I feel very like bored and stuck Mm. when I'm in a tub. So it was really nice to be in the shower. Um, and, um, my husband was just in and out of the shower, giving me water, um, holding my hand, And, um, yeah, this is like, this is the labor where I said the funniest line ever, where I was like, at one point I was feeling so much intensity and like my voice was starting to crack because I was like really, really yelling so much. Mm -hmm. So instead of like explaining it, because of course I'm in labor, I just said, I am Tarzan. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I am doing this. And I was like tempted to say, I can't do this. So I said, I am doing this. I am Tarzan. And it's like, what about? Um, my voice is just cracking so much. I, I couldn't, I was like trying to make a joke, but it just came off as like this intense statement and declaration. Um, <laughs> um, I love so, that. <laughs> yeah, it was so cute. Like I just, yeah laboring Jess is so cute Mm. (laughs) and so vulnerable and open. And I just knew it would work. Mm -hmm. I just really knew it. Um, it It's just, it felt so obvious to me that it was going to work. And it was because of just all the work I did around just loving birth and trusting it and craving it. It made it so that just every moment was absolute bliss and joy, even though it's, it is straight up painful. 
like birth hurts. It really does. But in this really healing way, Mm. um, and in this really beautiful, powerful way. So Mm -hmm. I, I loved it. Um, and in my head, I had only been in labor for like 30 minutes. Okay. All of a sudden, and it had been more like four hours. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I started, my body started to push my baby out and I was like, so in denial. I'm like, I'm not even doing this. Like my body's just doing it. There's no way I'm, I looked at my, you know, doula friend. I just like asked her, I was like, am I supposed to be pushing right now? And she's like, well, if you're pushing then probably. And I was like, (laughs) I guess I'm pushing. And, um, so easily and beautifully and intuitively, like I just got into the right position and she slipped out and I caught mm-hmm. her and it was so perfect and simple. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely, I absolutely loved the experience. Um, and were you and- at that point still in the shower or did you move back into the closet? To yeah. the- I was in the shower. So in the shower, I moved from sitting on the ball to laying on the ground mm-hmm. onto my side and lifting my leg, which was so interesting, like so intuitive because mm-hmm. no one ever showed me that birth position, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I went from there to my hands and knees to putting my arms on the ball. And then I went on my knees okay, um, and caught her. Wow. So a very beautiful dance of position. Yeah. Yeah. And just intuitively led, you know, that's so beautiful that you did all of these things. And it was just because you were listening to yourself. You just knew Mm -hmm. your body knew. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I loved it. Um, and she was so sleepy. She's my, my baby that really did not want to nurse. Mm. She just wanted to rest. And I just, um, I knew she was okay. So I just let her rest and Um, it took a while. I, since this is like what I've learned about myself is I like with both of my births, I actually didn't know how to push because my body just did it for me. Mm -hmm. And so when it came time for the placenta to come out, um, my placenta was like ready. And this is based on like looking back because in the moment I was, did not know what was going on. I was like trying to birth my placenta and, Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know how to push. (laughs) So I was trying to do the coughs, you know, and the sitting up and the like just different positions. And I, it it had been like, you know, a couple hours and I did feel like my placenta was like dropped. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of happened is it wasn't being born and I wasn't aware of how to push it out. Um, or I wasn't even listening to my body fully because I think I was, I wasn't fully confident in that part of the birth yet. Like I didn't even realize that I hadn't done any work around it, but it's like, when I was finally there, I was like, oh, I'm not trusting myself all of a sudden. And Mm -hmm. I don't know when the placenta is going to come out and I don't know how it's going to feel. And, um, what kind of ended up happening with my body is my body started wanting to bleed. So like the placenta had detached and was ready to be born. And so my body started to bleed and the placenta needed to come out, Mm -hmm. but you know, I wasn't allowing that to happen. Um, whether it was psychologically or, you know, physically, I wasn't doing what needed to be done. Mm -hmm. I started getting really dizzy Mm -hmm. and, um, I was, I mean, being dizzy for me was truly really fun. It was a trip. I loved it. I <laughs> really freaked out my husband. He was like, what is going on? And I was like laughing and <laughs> felt like I was going over a rainbow. And, <laughs> and so he keeps like really freaking out. And, um, I actually, I forgot to mention this. There was a midwife that had given me, um, side attack. Mm. Cause she just was like, well, since you have a septated uterus, you might bleed and, you know, too much. And so if you feel woozy, you know, you should take this. And, mm. you know, I was still on my journey, you know, with everything. And so I had, I decided to take that. I was like, all right, go get the thing. And, um, I honestly, I mean, I'm sure it did something because mm-hmm. of course, but I, I have no idea because 
everything that happened after that felt so spiritual mm. and about me that it felt like I wasn't even at the effect of that drug at all. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I was, but like, it just didn't feel that way for me. Um, so I started to like go even more and like really close my eyes and like drop into the peaceful, um, nature of passing out or, you know, whatever I was doing. And my, my doula friend, she came up to me and she looked at me in the eyes and she was like, Jess, it's time to get the placenta out. And so I just looked up at her. I like opened my eyes really big and I reached into my yoni and pulled my placenta out with my hands and put it in the bowl. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) I felt really cool after that. And I felt so much better just immediately. So yeah, that was really good. Um, So it was a very, you know, once again, like interesting energy around my placenta, I think. Um, And I don't know if it stems from me initially allowing myself to have the belief that my placenta was insufficient in some way with my son right? and with my daughter. And then I looked at it, you know, when it came out and I was like, oh, it's small again. You know, like it was that disappointment. Like there's something I did wrong again. What did I do wrong with my diet? Did I, Mm -hmm. I didn't eat enough. And, you know, like I was having those kinds of thoughts. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, but postpartum with her was so much fun. It's just so fun to stay home. Who needs a catheter when you've got your own bed? Mm-hmm. And, um, it was, it was so cozy and lovely and, um, yeah, it, it really just, I, I did it. And I just, I just knew that that's how I would want to birth all of my babies. And, um, yeah, so much fun. And she's such a chill little girl now. Hmm. and her name is Exora Um, and um, I forgot to mention my son's name is Era and he is actually named after one of my ancestors oh wow that we found when we were doing family history which we're almost positive he was an enslaved man Hmm. and his name was Era which is so cool yeah um so that's been really beautiful um to have him be named that and then Hmm. yeah had Exora and was so excited to give birth again that I got, actually got pregnant when Exora was 10 months old. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like fertile and I was like, let's just have another baby. Cause I want to, <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I went through that and, um, I, yeah, really. I mean, it was just so easy this time. I just told everybody, yeah, I'm just going to have a free birth and no one's going to be there and it's going to be fine. Mm. And it's so amazing how, when you shift your energy to just being sure about your own choices, Mm -hmm. people accept it a lot of time Mm -hmm. when you don't have this like nervous energy, like, what are they going to think about me? And I need to prove to them that I'm responsible and that I'm doing the right thing. And I didn't have to do that at all. I just was like, yeah, this is what we're doing. And they were like, okay. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> like, even if they were like, they would maybe, you know, express like, oh, it's like, I literally was so unfazed and just mm-hmm. smiled and just like, yes, it's going to be perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had such an interesting experience um, during that pregnancy because my husband and I separated for four months of that. Okay. Um, and that was really intense. Um, something that I've mentioned before when telling my birth story is that, so my dad, um, my dad had died when I, before I was born. Okay. And I was a breech baby and I was the third child in my family. And my dad was this, these, these all apply to what I'm going to say, but, um, and my dad was 30 when he died um, and my husband was 30 when we separated and we were having our third child and she did end up being breech. Mm-hmm. So, so interesting mm-hmm. that happened there. Um, it felt like, yeah, like I was replaying something and I was meant to make, I was meant to, to change the story, Yeah, totally. which I absolutely did. 
Um, and I'm even now still changing that story mm-hmm. in some ways, which is so beautiful. Um, um, so yeah, so that, yeah, that pregnancy was great. No complaints here. Didn't need anyone. Um, I, I had a lot of support. I had a lot of love. I had a lot of sisterhood. Um, I had started a women's circle, um, while I was pregnant and and that was so, so, so nourishing to me. And, um, it's like, if you don't have community, you have just create it. Mm -hmm. There's take responsibility, just create it. It actually works. Yeah. Um, just be consistent. And now I have so many amazing friends and I'm actually overwhelmed with how many women I'm fully aware would do anything for me, Mm. um, and be there for me if I needed someone to cry with. Um, so it's, it's been such a blessing in my life to have that kind of community. Absolutely. That's so special. Yes. Yes. The village is so necessary and important. Um, I've learned that a lot lately. Um, so, um, yeah, so my next birth, so it was nighttime and we were just chilling, watching a show and I fell asleep throughout that pregnancy, I had actually had really severe, um, a very, very severe yeast infection where I had had like rashes all over me. And, um, so I guess it wasn't like an easy pregnancy. I kept saying easy fun. And now I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> that, was, that was hard. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I had been having like, you know, a lot of, um, cervical fluid, like, you know, trying to cleanse me throughout all that time. <laughs> that had just been a very like normal occurrence. And sometimes it would come out really fast. And so when I had like, I woke up from him and my husband and I watching a show and I like squirted something mm. onto the couch. I was like, Oh, <laughs> my cervical fluid is everywhere. And I was like, gosh, this is ridiculous now. And mm. He looked closer at it and he was like, I think that's amniotic fluid. So I'm going to go to bed and you wake me up when you're ready to be in labor, to, like when you need help. And I was like, no, I'm not in labor. <laughs> because I was like fully anticipating that my baby would come after 40 weeks. Like my daughter did hmm. and it was 39 weeks. Exactly. And the next day was going to be my nesting day. Mm, yeah. Cause I literally did nothing. <laughs> this baby was born. I, I think maybe just having two kids makes it so that nesting just looks very different mm. it's more state of mind <laughs> <laughs> and actually organizing stuff. Um, so I was like looking at the house and it's like, I had been putting it off the whole weekend and I'm like, no, I cannot be in labor. Like the house is wild. Um, and I called my mom and as I'm, you know, doing my thing, pooping and pooping and pooping, <laughs> Like I always do before I have a baby. I'm like, I'm not in labor. She's like, no, you're not in labor. And we're just like talking about how I'm not in labor. Mm. And then um, suddenly I got this really special sensation, you know, this really special contraction. Mm. That was like, hmm. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'm just going to get the house ready. And then I'm going to go to bed because it's probably nothing. Mm. Um, And as I was getting the house ready, I just continued to leak amniotic fluid. Um, and it was, I was like, okay, fine. And I, but I was so excited, of course. Um, and we actually had a tent set up in one of our rooms. That's where I wanted to give birth. For some reason, every time I would like try to manifest the birth that I want and like dream it up, I could only picture myself in a tent, like an indoor tent, Mm. which I had never like seen someone do before, but I just really like wanted to feel protected and held by something, but I didn't want to be in like my closet again. Mm. Um, cause that was like all of like the right angles and the hard floor. Like I didn't want that. I was like, I just want to be like, just like having a blanket over me, but not. Mm -hmm. And so it was, so I, I got towels. I gave my husband a list of things to do. Um, and, um, 
I said, um, at one point I did have to help one of my kids go back to sleep before it had gotten more intense. And I told my, I told my dad, I said, okay, dad, like help Exora stay asleep through this, please. And then I said to my great, great grandmother, I said, okay, Mary, come with me. And it was like, mm. at the time, it just felt like a very whimsical thing to say, but it was so true. Um, I, I really felt her with me holding space for me um, during that time. So I, you know, got into my tent and I, I said, okay, I'm not coming out of the tent. And this was like, maybe about an hour had passed or so since I had, um, first leaked the amniotic fluid. Mm -hmm. And then it had been just like maybe 30 ish minutes since I had felt that like twinge, you know, like the real first contraction. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I went in the tent. I was like, I'm not coming out until the baby's born. So you come and visit me whenever you can. (laughs) And yeah, you just make sure the babies are okay and let my mom know to come. So, and it was, it was amazing, of course, because birth is just amazing. And I, I just have so much gratitude for it. Um, it really is. I I've actually been through so, so, so much the last, um, five or so years, there's been just this consistent, um, traumatic experience that has come up in my life and that I've allowed to exist in my life, Mm. um, where I'm not respected and where I'm, um, uh, being abused and degraded. And I really think that this labor, I, I really utilized it as a tool for me for healing Um, I think I, I unintentionally did that with my birth with Exora. I felt like I was just healing the, um, the hospital birth kind of like, it was just like the reclamation of what should have been or, you know, whatever. But this one felt so, it it had a lot of weight and I held it very lightly because I knew that all would be well. Mm -hmm. And that allowed me to be open to all of the medicine that was there for me. But I really, it's kind of that effortless power, power thing that I was talking about before Mm -hmm. being able to be in labor as a woman. It's so, it's so amazing to just sit there and revel in your own power Mm. Once again is inside of you and is effortless and is joyful and is there to help you Yeah, there to teach you. And, um, I think so much energy is moved through our bodies when we give birth. Um, so many negative energies are released and transformed. And that's, you know, how we're transforming into a new mother. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I was, I was talking to my dad during that labor. I was talking to my great, great grandmother. I was talking to my baby, um, baby Indigo. I knew that she was going to be a girl. Um, And I, I was talking to her and encouraging her and I wanted to be in labor for, um, much longer than I was. (laughs) It was a very quick experience. (laughs) It was so fast. It was, it was like an hour basically. Oh, no way. Yeah. From like the first, like, um, yeah, maybe like a little over an hour. Um, I like when I went in the tent, it was 11 and then I had her at 1155. Wow. That's quick. I know. I was like, come on. I want to be here. I want (laughs) to experience this. So very potent medicine, not, not like supplemented, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like, "Mm, Mm -hmm. there's everything that you need, um, to transform into the mother you're meant to be. It was so fast. Um, and you know, I've never experienced labor where it's hours and hours and hours. Um, and I don't pretend to know what that's like, Mm -hmm. Um, but I do know that if I could make a choice to be in labor for like eight hours, that would 
hit the spot right, <laughs> for me. <okay. laughs> um, I think it would. I might, maybe I'll change my mind someday when I'm in labor for eight hours, but <laughs> for right now that sounds really nice. Mm -hmm. Cause just being in that, and it's just so delicious. Like just being in that, um, that consciousness and being so deep, um, and present mm. and, um, and just being able to trust yourself. I think I haven't always experienced that in my life. So it's like, it's kind of like when I, you know, had my son, I was birthing how I live, but now I'm making it a goal in my life to live how I birth right. because my births are like, amazing compared to the rest of my life at the moment. Yeah. Um, I'm creating an amazing life, of course, but it's like my births are kind of like my motivator in some ways. Cause I look back and I'm like, Whoa, mm. look how powerful I am. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so that was, that was beautiful. And when I finally started pushing, um, I, I had this contraction that felt like seven years long. It was just like going and going and going. <laughs> and so I screamed for my husband to come in and I, it was, I was like, it's not stopping. And then I got on my knees, like, you know, that's my pose, I guess my position for birthing, but I got on my knees and I felt her, I, I felt something <laughs> I felt something mm -hmm. and it was not a head. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, I was like, I think we're having a, and everything just got like, so like, like, so I had like, she had crowned or whatever. And I was like a portal and I was a, a collapsing star and I was an explosion. And it was like the most powerful thing I've ever felt. I screamed at the top of my lungs. It was amazing. Mm. But yes, once I felt her, it's like everything went silent. Mm. The pain did not feel like pain anymore. Mm. It just felt like, I just felt like a door opening, like a really heavy door <laughs> opening, but it just felt so, um, it felt like, it, it really felt like my daughter was descending from heaven because I was just narrating to my husband, everything that was happening. He was like near me, like at the door of the tent, which the tent's like not huge, but he was at like the door of it. And I was just feeling, you know, with my hands describing it to him and saying like, okay, like a foot just came out. Okay. Now the other foot is coming out. Now her torso is coming out. And I was just like, just happy tears, just like so honored to have this experience because that's how I was, I, I was supposed to be born. And that's how my son was supposed to be born where you're literally descending like an angel, yeah. you know, gracefully putting your feet on the earth. And, you know, she just flexed her body when she put her feet down and then her head was born and I just picked her up. And, um, and I just held her so close and I was just, it was just joy. Just, wow. it was Indigo. Of course it was my girl and she wow. has blue eyes, <laughs> Indigo eyes, Indigo mm -hmm. child. And, um, it was, yeah, such, such a perfect, gorgeous, potent experience for me. Um, mm -hmm. so much healing there. And so much information for me about who I really am mm. and how powerful I am and um, how much joy is built into every experience in life, even the painful ones. Right. One of the lessons that I'm learning a lot from this birth still is that, you know, with life comes, you know, all of these situations that where that are really, really heavy and really intense. And can I allow myself to enjoy the exquisite nature and the heaviness of that pain that I'm experiencing or the suffering that I'm experiencing and being ready to be transformed by it and being joyful about 
what I'm birthing into the world Mm -hmm. is my higher self. So I'm still learning from that. And I still hate suffering sometimes, most of the time, but (laughs) some, but every once in a while I can catch myself and remember how much I loved the pain of, you know, her crowning and of just the fastness of it all. Cause you know, it was such increased intensity with it being one hour, but Mm -hmm. um, just allowing myself to have this underlying gratitude, even when I'm moving through Mm -hmm. the most challenging um, part of my life at the moment, even I am. (laughs) So I'm like, so grateful that that birth really set me up. Um, and it's so beautiful the way that you explained it, how everything went still, and it's just this beautiful descendants of this baby coming down and through you. Like, mm-hmm. it's just like, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. beautiful word! So Full circle great. body for me. Oh, yeah. wow, yeah, I, I loved it. And my daughter, Exora, came and sat next to me, and she was like totally feeling the birth high with me she was like awake for like the next three hours just like being with me very attentive asking about the baby so 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 perfect she's an angel and um I loved having her close to me during that time my mom actually arrived 15 minutes after the baby was born Mm -hmm. and she was able to help me to the bed along with you know my husband helping as well and um I attempted to birth the placenta and we finally figured out like that. I did not know how to push (laughs) because I started saying like, well, I feel like the placenta is ready to be born, but nothing like I can't, like, I was like, "Uh, uh." (laughs) like, this is not working. And then finally, like my body started wanting to push, you know, from my butthole. And I was like, oh, that can't be it. (laughs) She's like, I think that's it. I think that's what you're supposed to do. (laughs) I was like, no, okay, fine. Like I'll push from my butthole, but like nobody told me. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) Um, And yeah, that totally worked. My placenta came out, but this time she was like, the membrane was still inside of me. So the placenta was hanging out of me from the membrane. Wow. So interesting. And so I was like, do I push more? So I like tried to push more, you know, my new skill of pushing through one's butthole Mm. and did not budge. And I'm just like, like kneeling, the placenta's hanging. And I was like, okay, I'm going to make a choice. I'm going to be super aware of if I do have her retained placenta at all, because I know my body, I'll listen and I'll go get help if I need to. Mm meantime I'm going to very gently rip the placenta and just Mm -hmm. remove her from my body so Mm -hmm. I gently did that she she looked funky in the bowl for Mm -hmm. sure um and I never had any um symptoms of retained placenta and in fact I do believe that I passed some pieces of the membrane or any like pieces that were left behind. Cause Mm. it's almost like the placenta fully detached. Yeah. But then there were just these pieces that, yeah, that stuck inside of me, but Mm. not, it was still detached. So it came out with the lochia. Yeah. Because I kept thinking, is this clots? And I was like feeling it. It's like, these are not clots. These are pieces of something, which is probably the placenta. Mm. Um, so that was like really cool. I had like never heard of anything like that before. Right. Well, maybe like when it detached, it just kind of did like a somersault. So yeah, the membranes just got flipped mm-hmm. up and then because it's so heavy that it just came down and, you know, you never know because you, you mm-hmm. don't see like what's going on inside there. But yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. The mystery of it all. I'm, yeah. And I'm so excited to do more work around my placenta and um because yeah once again you know she looked funky she was small but just also accepting like I make small placentas that are so unique and so right. beautiful that still nourish me <clears throat> and still did so much beautiful work for me and I don't look I don't look or act like everyone else why would my placenta do that when you say small because you said your first baby 
came out only seven pounds. Granted, he was taken out, um, you know, well before his time. Um, yeah. How much was your second daughter, Ixora? How oh. do you know how heavy she was? Yeah. So my son was like, um, he was almost six pounds. So he was oh, like, okay, almost, six, yeah, almost six pounds. Um, and I feel like all the placentas are about the same size that I've had and I've had yeah. like lots of different eating habits. So it's really interesting. Um, okay. and then my daughter, she was a little over seven pounds. And okay. then my second daughter, she was under just under seven pounds. I really should like have their weights. That's fine. In like, my brain, I but I really don't. <laughs> no, that's fine. But you know, those that's still those are still tiny babies. Like yeah, obviously that's... you had perfectly healthy babies, but the yeah. placenta grows big enough to carry the size mm-hmm. of the child. So it's not like it needs to be the size of a dinner plate, you know, for a little right. tiny seven pound baby to kind of sit in the middle. So that's so true. I mean, I don't think that you technically have small placentas. You just have placentas right. that are maybe smaller than what a people expect to see with like an eight or nine pound baby because like the baby's bigger so the placenta must be bigger yeah so I feel like yeah totally I like yes I was like mom what size were your placentas she's like why would I know that (laughs) I gave birth in a hospital I didn't know any of this stuff Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, yeah my placentas are like probably they were probably like the size of um yeah, a dessert plate, <laughs> not a dinner plate, okay. but a dessert plate. Dessert plate. Yeah, uh, I mean, so I, I feel like that's pretty, pretty normal for the, if you're having, maybe if it was a 10 pound baby and a dessert plate size placenta, it'd be like, hmm, interesting. Yeah, but, I would love to like, um, me and my friend were talking about this the other day. We're like, we would love to like see more placentas mm-hmm. and see what the lifestyle of the woman is along with her, her food, but also her relationships and also the place Mm -hmm. she lives in and just like analyzing not what's wrong with people's placentas, but why, because I just, I I'm definitely coming from a place of curiosity Mm -hmm. because I have some shame, but now I'm just like, Ooh, why is this the case? Cause my body is so unique. I've got the septated uterus. I've got, you know, the, exactly anemia I've got the tiny placenta I've got the two breech babies out of three babies you know like there's so much going on and it's so unique to me and I really wouldn't be able to work with a um a licensed midwife at this point like it's actually just most licensed midwives don't even want me I'm exactly none of them wanted me so yeah (laughs) I'm just so I'm so grateful for this journey that's still happening because I'm, I definitely want to have more babies. Um, Mm -hmm. and it'll be so interesting to see like how many more, um, breech babies I have and, Mm -hmm. you know, how my relationships with my placentas, um, changes and grows and becomes really, I think I, I can get it to be very powerful in the future. Absolutely. So much healing to do, and I'm so excited to do it in birth. Mm-hmm. And I wish I could just heal in birth only and not have to do like all the other hard things because <laughs> yeah. it's so easy. Your body's like, I got this. We're going to heal. It's going to be fun. You just sit back and ride the waves. And yeah. I would do that every month if I could. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, what's so beautiful about your story and the way, you know, with your, um, your uterus and yeah, everything about you is that you're just the perfect example of a variation of normal for a woman. You know, you don't fit into this really rigid box that the medical system says you have to fit into in order to be a quote unquote healthy mother that can deliver healthy babies. It's like you, you have breech babies, you've got a septum in your uterus, you know, you're all of these things that you know, as you said, would create you to be high risk and no medical midwife would work for you. But it's like, that's fine. You're totally in the range of normal for yourself, which yes. is is so beautiful to, so I'm so grateful to hear um, these stories from you because it just goes to prove that the box of normal that the medical system provides for us means mm-hmm. nothing. It means absolutely nothing because every woman in and of herself creates her own standard of what is normal and what is safe and what is high risk, low risk, medium risk. So you can't, 
you just can't use that for everybody. And mm -hmm. yeah, you're the perfect example of having these two beautiful births after your hospital birth, which was unnecessary to yeah. having these great experiences <clears throat> with, with your children and like that you want to do it again and more and more because the healing power that comes to you, the strength, the power, all of this is the gifts and the medicine that you wouldn't be receiving if you just kept going back and defaulting back to the hospital system because you're high risk and, you know, all these silly things. Your uterus isn't the right way to give birth. It's like, literally hilarious at this point yeah it's wonderful I love I love that like yeah I I all of this all of these stories and rumors are being told about women like me and I'm just like no mm -hmm. that, no that's just not it's just not a thing and it's it's lovely being able to be that so that mm -hmm. I, I love telling women my birth story and truly just normalizing the fact that women like me can do that and that all women have access to it. And we do need to listen to our bodies and we do get to choose where we birth and how we birth. Mm -hmm. But just knowing that that's available to us totally. when we're told over and over again, there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so available to you and it just requires you to look inward more and to feel mm -hmm. And, oh, and like you said, create your own standard. I love that. Yeah. I love that language so much. Yeah, totally. And that's what you've done. That's beautiful. That's what you've done. And you've had these amazing, rad, powerful birth experiences. And you're just like, I want to go back for more. <laughs> Give me more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's so, yeah, your stories are just so, so powerful. And so I love them. I, I absolutely love hearing them. It's so, it makes me so excited to be like, yeah, okay. I knew it. This is what I'm feeling. Like when yeah. I have my baby, I'm, I know it, like, it's going to be great. And just hearing oh. these stories just like amps me up where I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm ready for it. Bring it on. <laughs> yes. It's so exciting. Yeah. Pick yourself up for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh, thank you, Jess, so much. I'm, I'm so grateful. Your stories. Oh, I'm going to have to listen back to this and yeah, just feel in this energy and all of the power that comes through. <clears throat> but um, if there are women that say have the bicornate you know, uh, uterus with the septum in it or have breech babies and they want to reach out to you, how can they get in contact? Um, because you also said you're, you're a birth keeper and you do birth work. So yeah. How can these women get to you? Yeah. So I do birth work and I also do, um, <clears throat> um for women in Arizona USA um I have an Instagram jess.aurelia and Aurelia is spelled a-r how is Aurelia spelled a-r-a-l-i-a -A. yeah that is true I told I, I spelled it right um so yes that it's jess.aurelia and then if you live in Arizona please follow the Sonoran Sisterhood um account for the gatherings and um I definitely love receiving dms um about birth and questions for sure um yeah yeah that's all that's <laughs> wonderful yeah I'm sure there's going to be women that are totally going to want to reach out, speak to you. And if they're in your area, like mm -hmm. I want to come to your gathering and I'm in Canada. I'm like, how can I make this happen? <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. It's just been so beautiful having this conversation with you. I'm so grateful that you have all of these quote unquote high risk, you know, yeah. potentialities, but you've still just had the most amazing births because you just set your own standard of what is normal for you. And you did it and you trusted yourself. You trusted your body. You trusted your babies. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the premise of, you know, birthing in this way. Yeah. Thank you sisters so much for listening to this episode of the free birthing color podcast. If you'd like to work with me one-on-one -on -one in a primal activation session, donate to the podcast, or to have your story featured here or in the blog, go to primalwomanportal.com for all the information to do so. Did you want to connect with our guest speaker? You can find all her information linked within the show notes. And if you have time, please subscribe, 
write a review, and tell a friend to have a listen so that this podcast and these stories of women birthing in their total power can be shared far and wide. Don't forget to check out the show notes for information on the Earth Daughters Women's Festival, the Breach Without Borders workshop, and much more. New episodes drop every Thursday morning, so stay tuned for the next amazing story to be shared on any platform that you prefer to listen to your podcasts on, or watch these episodes on the Free Birthing in Color YouTube page. And remember, your voice and your story matters. So if you're a woman of color or an Indigenous woman who's had a wild pregnancy and or birth outside of the medical system, submit your story because it's so important that your voice is heard and celebrated in your radical journey of pregnancy, birth, and motherhood.